Amen. Amen. Six of you are good looking. Uh, Amen. Amen. Switch mics here now. Okay. I'm going to keep the chair up here. I don't think I'm going to need it. It's just the pastor goes long this morning. I need a place to sit down and take a nap. Hopefully he won't. And after the service this morning, don't go running off because before we all leave this morning, we dismiss. We had five graduates in our class, in our, in our church, five graduates here for the church uh, this, this past school year, some high school, some college, and we have a little gift for graduates. So please, uh, after we're done with the message and everything today, we're going to have them come up front. Yes. Yes. Let's get you pre morning. Uh, come up front. We'll give you a little gift, and then we want to pray for you all as the Lord sends you whatever direction you're going to go. Because when you graduate, you're entering a new period in your life, aren't you? You're heading in new directions, new things, and all that wonderful stuff. But before we do that this morning, we want to go ahead and finish off our series on the I Am Statements of Jesus. And so I want us to turn in our Bibles to John chapter 15. Verses 1 through 5. John 15, 1 through 5. If you would stand with me this morning as we read the word of God. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you do nothing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I thank you, Father, for what you have started during the time of worship and during the time of giving. And now, Lord, we, we enter into this time in your word. And Father, as important as everything else is, the worship, Lord, and drawing us into your presence, the giving, Father, and, and acknowledging what you have done for us and giving back unto you for the furthering of your kingdom. Father, it, it pales in comparison to what it means to spend time in your word, to get the truth of your word and to internalize it, make it a part of who we are. And this morning, Father, as we close out this series, I pray in Jesus' name that your word would speak truth and life to each and every one present this morning. I pray that the power of the word of God would minister to each and every life here today. And we thank you for it. Never let us neglect this word, Lord. Never, never let us neglect its truth. But Father, help us to always make it ours. As you speak to us through this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we come to the end of our series. Uh, the series of the I Am Statements of Jesus as recorded by the Apostle John. Next week we'll start a new series. Uh, and I don't know how long it'll go, uh, but it's, it's in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And we're going to talk about spiritual gifts and love. And so that's, I believe, the direction the Lord wants us to go next. And so I've prayed about it. I've gone the month of July, but who knows? It could go longer. There's a lot in there. Okay? And I believe, I truly want you, as we as we get ready to move into that this week, I would, I would like you all to be in prayer about the gifts. I would like you to be in prayer about the gifts uh, and, and the gifts of God. I, I think that uh, what, as we see things happening here in the church, one of the major, most important aspects of our, our relationship with Jesus Christ in our life and really the empowerment of the church is, is of course, the spiritual gifts and their proper usage. And so I would like, I would ask that you would this week be in prayer about that. But this morning we're going to finish this off. And over the past several weeks, Jesus has described himself as the I Am. And he had done so using the following terms. The first week we talked about Jesus as the bread of life. The next week was Jesus, the light of the world. Then there was the door to the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, 
Last week, the way, the truth, and the life. And now this morning, today, we close out by referring, he closes out by referring to himself as the true vine. Uh, and, you know, I kind of think about this, and I was looking at the order of these things, and I was thinking, should we close with the true vine? Or should, you know, like resurrection and life, that almost sounds like that should be at the closing, shouldn't it? Like, that's where you want to be. You want to talk about the resurrection and the life. But then I realized, as I was studying this week, some very, something very important about this passage. What sets this I am statement apart from the others that we've looked at? And there is something unique about this passage that we do not see in any other passage. Because here, Jesus' emphasis is not only on himself. This is the only one of those passages where he also brings the Father into what's going on. Jesus doesn't just say, I am the true vine. But we also see him mention the Father as the one who's going to what, do the pruning. Okay? Now all of a sudden, the Father wasn't in the bread of life. He wasn't in these others. But now all of a sudden we see that what Jesus is saying here, it's more than just me. It's me and the Father. And so this becomes, I think, significant for us. Because what we're going to find here is Jesus now, where before we saw him as the focal point, that the emphasis was on him, he now becomes the mediator between us and the Father. He's the vine. He's not going to do any of the pruning. The Father's going to do all of that. But yet, we are the ones who are attached to this vine. So, so now Jesus has placed himself in the position as mediator between us and the Father. So uh, with that in mind, I think with everything else that's set up to this, it almost just, it just seems appropriate that now all of a sudden Jesus has talked about all that he is, but realize this, that in all that he is, it is the Father who has the last word. It is the Father now who will look down and decide, but understand that in looking down and making the decision about us, he does so in light of the Son. So they work together. And so it, it kind of, as I was reading this, it excites me to think about that, um, that Jesus is the mediator, the Father is the gardener or the vine dresser, and then we, of course, are just the lowly branches, just hanging off the vine. Right? That's all we are, just the lowly branches. So let's take a look at some things this morning that I think uh, are important for us to understand about this idea, this this. this I, I don't even want to call it necessarily a parable, but it's almost parabolic in nature with what Jesus shares here. And the first of these that we want to look at is that in understanding this, we must understand that a vine must be genuine. Now, in order to grow the right kind of fruit, it is important to plant the right kind of vine. Now, you know, uh, and think about that for a moment. Okay, so if I want a, if I decide I want to grow grapes, Okay, on a you know, little grape arbors. I can remember as a kid, a couple of our neighbors had those things, and we would just go through and eat them until they got sick. You ever do that? Yep. Those are good. But it was, they were, the reason the grapes were good was because the vine was good. Okay? I've gone past some where you look at them and everything's just like just kind of hanging there. Something's wrong with the vine itself. It's not producing good fruit. Good fruit will only come as a result of a good vine. And let's be honest, can we have any better vine than Jesus Christ himself? Right? So, with that in mind, uh, for this reason, Jesus refers to himself as the true vine. There is nothing else out there today by which spiritual fruit can be produced other than Jesus Christ. Think about that. We live in a world today where everybody has, you know, or many have ways of trying to figure out how to come up with some type of new spiritual truth or some new understanding or, or some new way to heaven. But Jesus Christ says, I am it. This is the only way. If you are not a part of my vine, you are not going to enter into the kingdom of God. It's just not going to happen. And, and uh, you know, I keep getting this imagery in my mind of this what he's saying here, because he's going to talk in a minute here, and he's going to share the idea of what do we do with the non-producing branches. Okay? The non-producers. You see, true believers cannot exist apart from Jesus Christ. Try as hard as you want. And I, I, I will tell you, I'm going to share some, some stories this morning, some illustrations from my life. 
And I want at the end that some of you that have been here a while have heard it. It's just been impacted my life so greatly. It's something that I'll carry with me to the grave, I'm sure, um, more than anything else. But um, there were times in my life when I felt I was a part of the vine, but I was not productive. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, in essence, I thought it was a part of the vine, but really I had put myself apart from the vine. And I found that the things that I did and the things that I attempted to do would not bear fruit. It wasn't until I found myself, and I'm going to have to use this term, grafted back into the vine, that I found that I was able to produce the fruit that led to salvation. Apart from the vine, we can do nothing. We must realize that uh, the vine is our genuine source of true life. You can run here and there, you can do whatever you want to be, you can try whatever you want to try, and everything pales in comparison to being a part of that true vine. The true life that we live is a life that we live because we, are, we have decided that Jesus Christ will become our source. There is no other source. And let's not fool ourselves into thinking there is because the world is going to offer up a smorgasbord of sources. You know? We went, we, I went to Maryland the other day uh, to, to get uh, Andrew's graduation present. And so, um, uh, and, you know, we had to go to the store and we had to try out different things and everything to get the one that he wanted and Praise God, he got the wife report. Uh, so it was great, right? But the point is, is that on the way back, we stopped at Golden Crown. Now, we used to go there all the time, but I realized something, that that's just not healthy. It's good, but it was his day. We said, where do you want to go? I want to go to Golden Crown. So we went there, and I realized something. You have to go there once in a while to realize you don't want to go there once in a while. Right. You know what I mean? Okay, and here's this huge buffet with all this stuff, and you just think, wow, this is just, you know, I want this, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want this. And I mean, I, I had a co-worker once, we had a, 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 a work lunch in there, and I, the guy came back to the plate and went like around the students. I mean, he had all this food, and he had mashed potatoes, um, and he had gravy in the mashed potatoes, and he had corn on the gravy, and I'm like, you know, you didn't realize you go back for seconds. second. He says, I will, I'll get another one of these. You know, I mean, I was, oh. but, but um, you know, and as I look at the food, it's all mass produced, and I think, really, how healthy is any of them? You know, honestly. Maybe the salad. I don't know. But it, 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 but it all looks so tempting. It all, it all draws you in. And that's what the world wants to do. The world wants to draw you in. Like, I was ready to go. Then they put out you know, those little slider burgers. I'm walking. I'm like, I'm done eating now. I'm just going to get up. I'm going to, you know, just walk over here for a minute. I'm like, oh, put the fresh ones out. I wasn't done. I had to have one more thing. But, but, uh, and the world tempts us that way and it draws us and its desire is to pull us away really to cut us off from the world. To pull us away from the true source. And we need to be careful. Let's not let the world do the pruning. Because the vine requires pruning. Hello? Can you flip that one for me, please? Thank you. Pruning serves two purposes. First, to remove the dead wood. Then to prepare the good wood for fruit bearing. And I, I get this image again, what Jesus is saying here, when he makes this statement, uh, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, prunes it, locks it off. Throws it, as he, will, as he will share down here around verse 6, which I'll share at the end again. Hey, if it's no good, it gets thrown into the fire. Now, I don't want to get into this whole theological debate of the fire being hell and everything like that. I think what Jesus is saying here, listen, if you don't produce, you're getting cut off. Let's keep it simple. Okay? You're not producing. You are not a part of the vine. However, if you are producing, the Father will prune you a little bit because when he prunes you, you begin to bear more fruit. You know, you begin to branch out and do more, bear more fruit, and it's for the glory of the kingdom of God. Because now, um, all the dead, all the dead 
wood or whatever has been pushed off to the side, it's been thrown away. And, and the resources and, that is the sun are now feeding the productive parts. Because the productive parts desire to be fed. <clears throat> True believers need continual pruning in order to produce good fruit. And I, I think about it, well, continual pruning. Yeah, it's not like one of those things where, you know, you just kind of, you know, lop it off and we go on our merry way. Um, you know, I, 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 I see every once in a while, you know, maybe you're watching a movie or something like that, and, and you see somebody, it's usually those little bonsai trees. Thank you, I was going to say Japanese tree. You ever watch them, they're always sitting there clipping it. It's like they're always trying to shape it, perform it, so that it will begin to grow and do what they want it to do. It's like, how could that be a life? I don't know. But, but the point is, is I, that's how I see the Father. It's like, okay, this is me right now. But the Father says, I'm going to do a little trimming around here because I think if I trim this and I do this and I trim a little bit of this, um, you're going to begin to grow the way I want you to grow. Not the way you want to grow. He's going to form us and to shape us as He desires us to be if we allow Him to do the pruning. Pruning is not always an easy thing. It's not always a pleasant thing. But honestly, uh, you know, sometimes there are dead branches that need to be removed so that the live branches can prosper. Our resources get pulled into certain areas or certain things that, that we, we focus on areas where we shouldn't be focusing on and, and overlook the areas where we can be prosperous and we can be prosperous. So vines do require pruning. Next one, please. Um, the vine must continue to produce. It's not enough just to be pruned, it requires production. The good wood must become a constant source of fruitfulness. A constant source of fruitfulness. Now, this is important for us to realize that if we're not a source of fruitfulness, we're not good wood. We're in danger of being cut off. And I think to myself, wow, you know, and some, some individuals might say, well, you know, that's, that's not fair, God. I love you and I love Jesus. But, you know, as much as, as, as important as that is, I think it, it's important for us to realize is what am I doing with that love? What am I doing with that relationship? What am I doing with what God has, has called me to do? Am I just, am I just sitting there being a, a bench warmer, a pew warmer? Or do I have this desire to go out and produce the fruit that comes from righteousness? The fruit that brings others into the kingdom of God. I thank God for those who were willing to do that for me. Those who prayed for me. Those who shared Christ with me. Those who, who took me to, to youth events and did certain things and did this and that. And then in my life when it took a turn away from the Lord. Those who were willing to not give up on me. And again, I believe many of us can, can understand exactly what I'm talking about here. I thank God for those who are willing to continue to produce the fruit that brought me back to Jesus Christ. Why should we do anything less? Why? And, you know, the, the importance of this. True believers whose source... I'm sorry. Whose source is divine must live a, a life of continual production. And, and, and realize this here. Okay, I think when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ and being in the vine, there is no fall and winter. Okay? We are in a constant state of production. <clears throat> we don't say, well, I'm in the fall of my life right now and I'm just sitting here withered away and waiting for spring to come so that I can start to produce fruit again. I don't believe that. I believe that we are in a constant, continual state of production. Do you understand what I'm saying? That Jesus Christ should be the center and the focus of your life each and every day. That we walk in the Spirit each and every day willing to be productive and to do what God has set us apart to do. Let's not wither away on the vine. Let's grow. Let's tap into that source. 
That is Jesus Christ. And finally, fruit bearing is certain if the branch remains in the vine. Uh, and uh, this is a little bit different than what I just said here about producing, continuing to produce. You can continue to produce. But again, I'm going to the idea of the winter of life. Uh, the idea here, it is certain. If you, are, if you live each and every day as part of the vine, if you walk in the Lord each and every day, if you love Jesus Christ, if you walk to be obedient to the will of the Father, then it is certain that you will produce the fruit of that vine. The fruit of Jesus Christ. That righteousness, that a life of righteousness, that others coming into the kingdom of God as you share Christ with them, is certain. And now I want to point something out here, and that is that we are not guaranteed the quantity or the quality of our fruit bearing. But fruit bearing is inevitable. As I, as I think about this, you think, well, what do you, you know, thinking, what do you mean, quantity and quality? If to Jesus, it's all good. Yeah, but sometimes I get in the way. Sometimes I think I know what's better. Sometimes I think that, uh, that you know, uh, if I do this or I do that, that, that um, we'll bring more, you know, more people will, will profess Jesus Christ, not necessarily accept it, but, you know, acknowledge that he's the Son of God. It's not just a matter of acknowledging, it's a matter of accepting Him. I think to just acknowledge, yeah, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus Christ, is low quality. And in all, in all honesty, when I talk about quantity, I realize when I talk about quantity that, you know what? Not everybody that we talk to is going to come to accept Jesus Christ at that moment in time. But if we use the right quality, then eventually we, we, get, we begin to begin the process of that grafting in that someone else may end up finishing. But it is inevitable. I truly believe that. True believers must not get caught up in statistics. You know? Uh, I was somewhere recently with a bunch of pastors and somebody asked a question. Somebody threw out a statistic. It was huge. It was, you know... Uh, What was that, like that old saying, you know, 90% of the people are wrong 50% of the time, you know, statistics, you can throw anything out, whatever you want to say, what? Anyway, and, and, and so I just looked at the guy and he said, I think he's speaking evangelistically, you know. Like, it's, it's the evangelist that had a, you know, he has a revival, he has a, you know, all these big auditorium, we had 20,000 people last night and 30,000 came to the Lord. I mean, really, you know, <laughs> think about that, that's those evangelistic numbers, right? Uh, let's not get caught up in that. Let's get caught up in lives. You know? Uh, I, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's like I hear people say, oh, look, 3,000 people have been to the church that day. You know, what, what growth in Acts chapter 2? Yeah, but they started with zero. Anything was growth, right? Why can't we have 3,000 out of the church every Sunday? Well, I don't know. But wouldn't it be exciting? To, it's exciting to have one added to the kingdom of God. Imagine one a week. Where you'd be in a year. Let's not get caught up in statistics. Let's not get caught up in quantity. But let's focus on the kingdom of God and lives. Let's not walk away and say, man, I shared Jesus with that person. They didn't accept him again. No, but you did something. You started something that someone else may, may have the, the, the pleasure of bringing to completion. Think of the last person you shared Christ with and they accepted Christ as Savior. Realize this, that that didn't happen in a vacuum, but somebody else had already started to begin the work of bringing them in. You were just privileged with the opportunity to help in grafting them into the sun. Bringing them into the body. And we pray now that they become productive as well. And they bear much fruit. I share all this this morning, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because as I was preparing the message this week, as I was going through all of this, um, a lot has happened this week, a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, there's just there's a whole lot going on and I just think that uh, the events of the past few days, especially in our nation's capital, have shown me the importance of Jesus' final I am statement. 
You see, there are a couple things worth considering as we close out this series in light of recent history. The first of these, I want to go back to what Jesus shares at the beginning of this. When he says, he prunes, he prunes it, verse 2, or verse, yeah, verse 2, okay, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The same Greek word is used for prune and clean by Jesus here. The same Greek word. And so what he's saying here is, I have pruned you. I have cleansed you. You are clean before the Father. Again, going back to the idea of Jesus Christ as mediator. What he's saying here is, if you are in me, you are cleansed. The Father has forgiven you. You are a part of me. A part of who I am. And I thought about that. I thought about how significant that is. Because see, pruning is the most important operation for maintaining fruitfulness in the vine. A completely fruitless branch is not worthy of its place in the vine. and has to be removed, whereas weak branches can be strengthened by pruning. You know, again, the idea here, notice what it says here. You might be weak, but you're, you can still be productive. Uh, we get caught up so often in this idea of, oh, I wish I could. I'll tell you what, I sat here this morning and listened to worship, and, and a long time ago, I, you know, when I was younger, I said, man, I wish I could do that. I wish I could go to the left and the right like Greece and, and Aaron, okay? I would trip over my feet. You know, I've been down there in the car on the floor like this woman. So, I, I'm not musically talented whatsoever. Okay, I can play the radio. <laughs> Amen. Yes. So, so, the idea here is that I uh, realize that we have certain things in our life, and instead of focusing on what we lack, let's begin to focus on what God has given us and blessed us with. Right? He, all of you have strengths. All of you have abilities. Some of you have abilities I could never begin to imagine having. And God wants to use them for the glory of the kingdom of God and that is your fruit. Use it. Use it in whatever method God has called you to do so. Those who willfully choose to defy the will of God will be cut off. That's a given. And pruning is the most important operation for maintaining the fruitfulness of the vine. A completely fruitless branch is not worthy of its place in the vine and has to be removed. Whereas the weak branches can be strengthened. Let's not become a source. I'll say this. Let's not become a fruitless branch who sucks the life out of the rest of the vine so that the fruit cannot produce itself because eventually God will cut it off. In Mark, I'm sorry, in John 7, 15, 7 and 8, Jesus goes on to say, However, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. What an often misinterpreted scripture. Ask whatever you wish, but if we're grafted into the vine, we're only going to ask what the vine requires, not what we want selfishly. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. When we become fruit-bearing believers, we bring glory and honor to the Father, not to ourselves. And John, he goes on in 16, verse 33, he reminds us, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. And as I was closing everything out, and I was thinking about this, I'll tell you what, after the Supreme Court decision on Friday, I got inundated with <coughs> Facebook messages, and Facebook posts, and what's the church going to do now because of the Supreme Court decision? And, you know, 
uh, some things go out and they're very productive, some go out and in fear. And I am so over this concept of fear in the kingdom of God. I, I, it's, it's ridiculous that as believers to think that there's anything any official or individual can do that will usurp the power and the authority of God. Any who try will be cut off and cast into fire. And in this statement, um, a lot of what's going on has really caused us to think about how this is going to influence and impact the church. And so the superintendent, general superintendent from the AG, he put out an email, and you can go to, uh, I think, to the website. There's even an article there at ag.org or whatever. Um, and I was reading through it. He was talking about for pastors and for people and for everything else. But he made this statement. This statement impacted me greatly. He said, and I quote, You are privileged citizens of a blessed nation. Use your citizenship well. Seek the common good. Advocate for the last, the lost, and the least. Speak the truth in love. And I thought about that, and I thought, wow, was, you know, in everything that we can do, and everything we talk about, the most important thing is that we speak the truth in love, but we can't do that unless we are a part of the body. Speaking the truth in love is bearing fruit. That's what it is. And many years ago, I'll go back to, 19, some of you have heard this, I don't know how many, but I'll go back to 1992, Clinton was elected to office the first time. Can I say his name out loud? <laughs> Recording this? No. Anyway, I remember we were living in Ohio. We were here and moved to Florida. So I was working as a temp in a meatpacking plant on the bacon line. That was fun. Yes. What are you doing? I'm standing there going like this. That bacon hit a button. Stops the line. Gives me everything. It was an exciting job. Yes. Uh, one, I'm glad it was temporary. I remember the Christian community talking about how awful it would be to have somebody like that in office because of all that they wanted to do and you know all the different plans they had and they were going to take our children away from us and we were homeschoolers. If you're homeschoolers, they're going to make it illegal and all this. And everything was awful and all this stuff. And, and so, you know, I... I'm not as much a politics junkie and a history junkie as I am a Jesus junkie, but I, it still interests me. Okay, and so I sat there and I, I watched the election results. We were supposed to watch this until 1, 2 o'clock in the morning just to see how things turn out and see how crazy, I guess, except people are in the decision making process. But anyway, so he gets elected office and I, and, I, and I had bought into everything everybody was saying to the point where I was, I was in fear. I believed what the world had to tell me. What the church had to tell me, and I was in fear. And I got on my face before God on the sofa, and I remember crying, in, praying in tears, God, what have you done here? Why have you allowed this to happen? And I went to bed, because he didn't tell me. <laughs> That's how God works usually, isn't it? When you want to answer right then, no. Got up the next morning, went to the meat packing plant. Parked my car in the, I mean, it was oh dark 30. You had to be there early. I guess the pigs get up early. So, parked my car in the lot, and I'm walking across the parking lot, and it hadn't rained or anything like that. The sun was just coming up, and there's this huge rainbow in the sky. Beautiful rainbow. And for some reason, I felt there was nothing atmospherically that warranted a rainbow. But as I looked upon that rainbow, and I walked across the parking lot, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and the Lord as clearly as if I'm talking to you right now said to me, who do you think is in charge? At that moment, fear left, and it's never come back. I share that with you to say, don't worry about what's going to happen in Washington or in Richmond or wherever. This is still God's show. And if we are grafted in and a part of the vine, and we continue to produce fruit, God will not be mocked. God will not be outshone. But God will continue to be God. 
And there is nothing anyone can do to change that. And that's what he's shown when Jesus makes this statement. I, I, I think to myself, thank you, God, for allowing my source of peace and comfort and life to be your son. Thank you, God, for those moments when I find myself kind of drifting a certain direction, but your son steps in and speaks my case before him. You see, even when things seem to be their worst, I challenge you to remain in Christ. With his pruning, we will see a great harvest. We will, I, you know, I, I don't know how, but I've got history on my side. And no matter how hard individuals, men, women, nations, rulers have tried to do away with God's plan, he is, he is still fulfilling it, and Jesus Christ is still on the throne. God is not dead. But he is praying. Right? Let's pray. This is closing this morning. I don't know how this fits in with what you think and what I'm sharing today, but I just believe it's important that we realize something. In Jesus' statement about being the true vine, what he's saying is, I am your source. There is no other. There's none. There is, there is no leader, no corporation, no other believer in the church or in the kingdom of God, no pastor, missionary, or evangelist that is your source of life. Only Jesus Christ. And this morning, it is my heart's desire and my prayer that you are a part of the true life. And that you are willing and ready and able Father, this morning as we prepare to close our time together, there is so much more. It's going our way. Like this morning as we were singing the chorus about, you know, being a child of God, not letting fear rule our lives. To be your child, Father, to be a part of, of your kingdom and your plan is such a wonderful thing. But Father, help us this morning to see why it is important that we allow the true mind to work through us to produce that fruit. And if you are here this morning and you are not a part of the mind, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I believe there are some that have been praying for you for a while. There are some that, that are seeking God that, that somehow things will change and the Spirit will break through. And maybe today is that day when you are grafted into the mind. And if that's you this morning, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to pray for you anymore. My assumption here is that every one of you you this morning, I'm going to lift you up in prayer. I'm asking for you. Say, Lord, I want to bear a lot of fruit. A lot. I thank you for what you've done for me, but I know there's more. I thank you, Lord, for these hands. Those are going to say, Lord, God, just, man, I, you know, I just want to be a horn of plenty. I just want to just pour it out. Honestly, it's not honestly with me, it's honestly with the Spirit of God because the Spirit is the one speaking to you. The Spirit is the one ministering to you. 
And finally, I just I have to ask this question. Are you afraid? Are you looking at things going around and saying, where, where is God in all of this? I want to pray for God's peace in your life. If that's you this morning, you've looked at how things have gone this week or got in the last six months or the last year or something's going on in your life and you're standing there right now saying, oh Lord, I just think, I don't know. I'm a slave to fear. said, Lord, I just want to bear more fruit for the kingdom of God. Not for my glory, but for yours. Because it brings glory and honor to you. When we bear fruit, God is glorified. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for those that want to do that. And for those this morning, Father, that said, Lord, I, I, I've allowed fear to take root in my life. And this morning, I want to give that up. I just can't imagine how I can say I'm a part of the mind. That Jesus Christ is my source of all things and yet allow fear to rule. And this morning I want to go back to the source. That is Jesus Christ. And I thank you for those who raised their hands. I pray Lord, that you would bless them. That you would begin to minister to them by your spirit and they would find you. Lord, continue to be with us. Continue to bless this church and its families. Continue to let Jesus Christ be glorified and let your name, Father, be lifted up above all names. There is no other. We give you praise and glory and honor in all things. Bless our week ahead. Bless each family represented here. And I pray, Father, that this week, for each one, 